grab your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Now, when, right before we took off on the trip, I was so excited to hit Mark chapter 13. I told my wife, man, I am so excited to get into Mark chapter 13. And then I went to the office and I asked Sarah on my way out, I said, what's Richard teaching on? Because he told me he was going to do a topical. And she said, Mark chapter 13. And I went, no! Okay, good. And you know what? I, I, I listened to the service. He, man, Richard did a great job with those first 14 verses. I thought he just did an excellent job, an outstanding job. So I'm thankful for that. And we're right in the middle of this prophetic chapter. It's the only prophetic chapter in uh, the gospel of Mark uh, that has to do with our future, with the future of the world, with the end times. So we're right in the middle of this this prophetic um, where Jesus is answering a question about the signs of the times and the end of the age. Oh, that reminds me, seeing Christine in here. If any of you guys need a Bible, you can raise your hand. Somebody will get you one if you'd like to follow along with us. Um, if not, most people have it on their phone nowadays. So if you're one of those guys, it's all right. Yeah, somebody said it. We won't judge you. No, but it's better there than, uh, than not at all, for sure. But uh, if you have a paper one, go ahead and do that too. Okay, so we're in this section. We're looking at, at the prophecy. When I, when I think about prophecy, there's a couple of kinds of people, a couple of kinds of Christians and, and mentalities toward prophecy, really. Um, there are the people that really like talking about prophecy, and they like hearing what God has to say about the future and the end times. They go, ooh, this is interesting to me, and they like it. Um, but there's also those kind of people that sort of have the idea of like, ah, I don't want to get caught up in all that stuff. Like I got, enough, I got enough to do with just me and Jesus and trying to be like him to worry about anything else and everything else in life. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say something like that. And you're like, okay, um, personally, and I, and I kind of understand that because <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, got, I still got a long ways to go in my being like Jesus. Like that's, you're right, that's a thing. But also, I want to know what God has to say about the future. Like, and if he's going to tell us what he says about the future, why would I not want to know that, right? I mean, that's where I'm at. So to me, it's not either or, it's yes. Yes, please, both. I want to grow in my Christ likeness. I also want to grow in the knowledge of the word of God and what he has to say. So, and, and when I think about that, the way that we choose to address or attack or however you want to say uh, uh, our teachings on, on Sundays and Wednesdays, I really like because what's going to happen is we're going to go through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. And so what happens when you do that is when you get to that place that Jesus talks about prophecy, you go through it wherever it is. So we're not going to miss anything. We're not going to have too much prophecy. We're not going to have not enough prophecy. We're just going to go through the Bible and hear what it has to say. And when it talks about the future, we hear what it says about... The... I like that. Personally, I like that. I'm excited about that. And so we just happen to be in one of those sections of Scripture this morning that we're going to look to the, the, the ends of the age. And uh, again, what... I don't know about you guys, but when I think about looking at what Jesus says about the end of the age, especially in today's climate, I think, yes, this is important. I want to know what God has to say about it because I look around the world and what do I see? Crazy. I mean, that's, let's just put it in a nutshell. Our world's going nuts, right? It's crazy. And that's what we're seeing. So it's important for me to know what Jesus, what God has to say about the end times, personally, I'm interested. And if you were to look at me and ask me, well, what is that? I don't understand. Why is that so important now? I would say, you are crazy. Where have you been? Do you live in the basement? Do you have a phone in your pocket? You know, do you hear anything that's going on? It, it's, it, there are things that are happening in our day and age that I've never seen in my lifetime that you've never seen in your lifetime. I don't care how old you are, right? I mean, it's, there's some crazy things going on. So this section of Scripture to me, 
I'm interested in, I'm excited about. Now, this section of Scripture, Jesus is really answering uh, kind of two parts of a two-part question that his disciples asked all the way back in verse 4. And I'm going to do a little recap. I'm going to try to keep it short. But he, he, in verse 4, they asked him, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when these things will be fulfilled. So they're asking Jesus when it's going to come to pass. They're asking him, what are the signs or what is the sign that we're to look for to, to, in order to know that the end of the age is going on, that's happening. And so Jesus is going to give us a very clear answer. But there was two parts of, the, uh, of this question that they were talking about. Number one is the signs of the destruction of the temple and what to look at around the time that the temple's destroyed. We know that that happened in 70 AD, so 30-ish years after Jesus, the temple was destroyed. That already happened. And the second is the sign of his coming. And we're speaking there of the second coming of Christ. So, and the second coming, just a disclaimer really quickly, the second coming is different than the catching away of the church, the rapture of the church. These are two different things. The catching away or the rapture is where Jesus comes to take the bride, the groom comes to take the bride, uh, that's us, the church, to be caught up to meet Jesus in the clouds, and we see that from Scripture, to be with him forever. So there's a place in John where Jesus talks about that he's gonna, if he goes to prepare a place, he's going to come bring us to be with him, that where he is, we're with, we are also. There's a place where Paul talks about that, us being caught up in the clouds, Jesus not actually physically landing on the earth at the rapture. And the second coming Jesus is going to land on the Mount of Olives in power and in glory, and he's going to split the Mount of Olives in two. It's going to be awesome. You're not going to want to miss it. You're going to want to be there for the second coming of Jesus, and we are going to be there. But it's when he comes again, not as the bridegroom, to take his bride without spot or blemish, to take her away to the great wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, but it's when Jesus comes as a victorious, conquering king to judge sinful man, Christ-rejecting man, to set things right and to set up his kingdom. It's going to be good. It's going to be really good. But this is the one. This is the part that we're going to be looking at primarily this morning. Jesus is speaking mostly of the things that are going to happen, the biggest sign that's going to happen before he comes in the second coming. Okay. So really quickly, last week we looked at something that Jesus referred to as the birth pangs. And excuse me, I'm, I'm not trying to wipe boogies or anything. I got a mustache hair that's going right up my nose. <laughs> it's part of this, you know, buyer beware if you're going to have a mustache Ladies, I don't recommend it. Okay. <laughs> so we looked at last week at the birth pangs, all right? The, these things that Jesus referred to as the birth pangs, the sign that, that we are to be aware of that are like birth pangs. They're going to continue to happen, and they're going to be more frequent in, or, or more in frequency, and they're going to happen more in uh, strength as well, or more in intensity as well. This is what happens. I don't know if you know this about pregnancy. It doesn't get easier halfway through. It keeps continuing to get harder. When the contractions start, they don't take a break. <laughs> they continue to come, and they continue to become more intense. So it's something to look forward to, but this is what Jesus is saying, that the, that the signs that are going to happen, and they're going to continue to happen, until we, and they're going to get worse until we get to that tribulation period. And really quickly, I wanted to go through the list of them. The first one is the wars and the rumors of wars. Is that happening? That is happening today. Again, and I, I would just encourage each and every one of us to continue to pray for what's going on in Ukraine. I was talking about that this morning and saying, you know, there's a part of me that's glad for social media because it's not just something that's happening way over there that I don't know about. You can see some of the things. You can see this mother that's been, looks like she's been bloodied and beaten. You can see the, 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 the young father who's putting his wife and daughter on a, on a bus to leave the Ukraine to flee because he can't. He has to stay to fight. There's some things that we get to see to say, Lord, help these people. And give us a passion because they're hurting. 
God, and, and again, like Mike said in announcements, I don't even know what to pray, but I pray, God, that your will would be done. I pray that you protect those innocent. I pray that you protect those children. But we're seeing wars and rumors of wars like we haven't before. Like Oh, I just lost battery powers. What's going on? Battery power? What's that? Well, we're seeing, we're seeing this stuff happen. I'm just going to put it down. But we're seeing this stuff happen like, like never before, like I've never seen happen. And, and it's not only, again, this is the difference in my mind, is it's not just what's going on in the Middle East. That's been going on. That's been kind of popping and brewing for a really long time. But now it's what's going on in Ukraine, in Russia, what's going on with China, with Taiwan. There's wars and rumors of wars that are escalating at this point in history. And all of it really is this jockeying for power, is this jockeying for uh, resources in order to be in control. We have a list on the list of things. We have earthquakes in various places. Of course, earthquakes are happening in various places. Really quickly, just kind of a current event. I don't know, over the last month, I don't know if you know that there was two earthquakes down in Roosevelt. In fact, the last one was on Thursday evening. Thursday night, there was an earthquake down at Roosevelt. And part of the, the thing that's interesting here is earthquakes in various places. The idea is that there's earthquakes in places that usually there aren't. And so I'm thinking, oh, I heard of that two days ago. All right, I mean, it's a little more than two days ago now, but I'm just like, okay, Lord, yes. Famines and troubles are listed. Really quickly, that word troubles in the Gospel of Matthew is a different word. It says famines and pestilence. And pestilence, which pestilence is not talking about bugs like plagues like Egypt, like flies and gnats and that kind of stuff. It's talking about pestilence with the idea of disease. And so, I, I, again, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, this has been going on. This is crazy. This is something that's been happening in our history like hasn't happened before in our history. To where I look around and go, man, this is, is, is weird. I mean, so much so that a guy that, I, that I, uh, I saw in passing one day was like, this feels like something of biblical proportion. And I'm like, what? He's not a Christian. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Do you want to hear about that? But this is one of those things, and I'm looking at, I'm looking at, at the evidence and the, and the history and the world and what's going on in our lives around us and what's going on with this pandemic. I mean, we've never seen, we've never seen a global like, infection like this before on that scale where, where there's been so many weird things happen, you know, where there's been seemingly, this, this seemingly this virus has been tampered with by man and released and and whatever is going on, we, we're seeing things like never before. We're seeing fear and division and kind of fear propaganda peddling. And we're seeing so many different things, mandates and just like there is a craziness and a darkness in the, in the world. And I mean, speaking for myself specifically, there's a darkness like in our government and what they stand for that I haven't seen before. And I'm looking around going, this is crazy. Now, I have to say, and you might be thinking like, um, excuse me, uh, uh, pastor, you're not supposed to be, you're getting political here. Now, in my mind, I'm not, I'm not trying to be political in one bit. All I'm trying to do is speak the truth and look at what God has to say about the truth and what he has to give to us. So, so this is where I'm at. I, I'm at a place where I, I want to speak the truth because this is the reality of where we're living in and I want to see what Jesus has to say as to our warnings and to our future. But we're living in a, in a time that is weird and it's crazy, but for the believer, it's exciting. It should be exciting. And that makes me, me question myself. What do I think when I look around at the crazy going on in the world? Am I scared? Or am I excited? Because God's doing something. Because there's a move that's happening. Because, again, not because I'm a, blood, a glutton for punishment, but because this means that the end is coming, and I know what happens in the end. It's going to be good. It's going to be real good. 
But also we know from scriptures that we have a blessed hope. And Paul talks about our blessed hope. Our blessed hope is that we have the hope that we are going to be caught up to be with Jesus. It's a huge part of the hope and the blessing and the excitement that we as believers get to have. And Jesus said, of these things, when you see these things, the end is not yet, but it's the beginning of sorrows. And again, there's that word. It's the beginning of sorrows. It's the beginning of the birth pangs. the beginning of the intensity of the frequency. But the very first thing that Jesus said in this whole section of Scripture, all the way back in verse 5, the end of verse 5, well, actually, it's the whole of verse 5. Verse 5 short. In verse 6, it's very important. The most important thing when it comes to the end times is that we do not be deceived, spiritually speaking. More important than counting earthquakes, more important than the pestilence and the viruses, more important than any of those things is that we would not be deceived spiritually, that we would be standing firm on Christ and knowing who we are and knowing where we are because of who he is. It's so important that we not be deceived. Now, when I think of this, and when I think of Jesus sharing what he does, that many will come in his name, saying, I am he, and deceiving many. There's something that comes to mind when I, when I was studying through this, and it was that we want to be a part of his family. We want to be his true sheep. What, John, what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, I want to be one of those that Jesus spoke of when he said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, and my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father are one. I want to be one of those, right? You with me? You all said, yeah. Yeah. No. Anyways, bad joke. <laughs> but when I look at verses 9 through 13 back in uh, Mark uh, chapter 13, it does a couple of things. And some people believe in, in this last section here, 9 through 13, that it speaks of people, the season of them heading into this time of the Great Tribulation, like the first three and a half years of it. And I could see why they would say that. When you look at the text there, it really has less to do with the content of verses 9 through 13 and more with where it picks up in verse 14 because he picks up in verse 14 right there in the middle of the Great Tribulation. And we know that, and we're going to get into in just a moment how we know that. But it's because of that, um, that, um, that moment, that time, the first three and a half years. So, if you just, but if you just read verses 9 through 13 by themselves in the context of this section, in the context of the two questions, it almost seems like Jesus, he turns to the disciples and he answers them and says, hey, but at this time, and this would be a word that they need to hear, there's going to be tribulation in the church. There's going to be destruction at this time heading into the destruction of the temple. They're going to face a bunch of difficult things. They're going to be brought into the synagogues, which that word there, the synagogues, is specific to Jewish tradition. We don't have synagogues here. It's specific to them being brought into the church, into the synagogues, um, and, and having to have these opportunities. You call, call them opportunities. It's persecutions, but to be witnesses of their faith and witnesses for Jesus before the kings and the rulers. And that also... He says to them, and when you go in to be the witness to the kings and the rulers, don't worry about what you're going to say. The, the Holy Spirit will fill you with power and give you the words to say. Which, by the way, that's a whole nother Bible study, but this is what the baptism with the Holy Spirit is about. That we would be filled with power and boldness to be witnesses to the world of Jesus. And so that's what Jesus is promising that they will get in these last days. And so now we move into verse 14 and picking up where we left off uh, with Pastor Richard here. And this section really gets to the sign 
uh, that we're to look to, that they were to know, and we, uh, of his second coming, that his second coming is, is near. And so we're going to look at these really quickly. Look with me at verse 14. And Jesus says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in it, or I'm sorry, in the field, not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter, for in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened these days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. So here we have it. I mean, we have the sign, the biggest sign that there is to know when the end of the age. And, and when Jesus comes at that end of the age time, I mean, it's going to change. Life's going to change. Life on this earth is going to change, obviously, and we're going to see that here in a moment. But everything changes here. It's the end of the age. The end of the age means new age is going to come. Okay, I'm sorry. I said new age and then realized that's not what I'm talking about, new age, right? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a whole new era in God. All right. But this is the sign. So Jesus reveals the sign, the biggest thing that would let us or the people who are there during that time of the tribulation know exactly where they were in relation to the end, in relation to the coming of Jesus. And what is the sign? It's the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. So this is the sign. And what is an abomination? Well, an abomination really just speaks of, especially in this context, an idolatrous offense that took place in the temple. An idolatrous offense to God. So when this evil, and, and this is going to happen, the evil, the Antichrist, is going to stop the sacrifices in the temple, and he's going to set up an abomination, which is an idolatrous worship in the temple, in the place of the sacrifices. In the Gospel of Matthew, he records, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. So it's specific. It's in the holy place. And this abomination of desolation is spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, and Daniel chapter 12. If you want to flip to Daniel chapter 9, you can. We're going to look a little bit at what Daniel has to say about the timeline. Um, and really, in Daniel chapter 9, he's going to show us in verse 27 the last week or set of seven years that is to happen which is the last week really for us to, to, to be fulfilled, for us to be watching for from the prophecies of Daniel. The first 69 weeks or sets of seven have already happened. We looked at them a few weeks back. They were fulfilled when Jesus rose, or rode in on the colt of a donkey. You got, you guys remember that on the triumphal entry. That time was fulfilled when Jesus came and he did that. And then, ultimately, when he died on the cross, that starts um, in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. So look, look with me, if you would, at verse 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. There's only one person that can do that, and it's the Messiah. It's Jesus, and he's done it. He's fulfilled this. He has also sealed up vision and prophecy. Only one person can do that, the Messiah. And also to anoint the most holy. So we see this fulfilled in the first 69 weeks of Daniel. And there's one week left, again, 
And we see that last week in verse 27, Daniel 9, 27. He refers to this last week and he says there, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but the middle, in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So we have this, this interesting um, filling in, connecting of some dots here by Daniel uh, in this verse. And the first thing we see there in verse 27 is the Antichrist does something. He makes a covenant with many for seven years, one week. It's the set of seven years. He makes a covenant with many, of course, we would believe that's in the Middle East, for seven years, bringing peace into the world at that time. Which again, this is one reason that Israel is going to actually think he's their Messiah. They're going to look at him, bring peace in the, into the Middle East. And then the other thing that he's going to do, he's going to allow Israel to rebuild the temple because there's going to be sacrifice going on. Now, just really quickly, for us as Christians, as, believer, as believers, we, have, we should at least have mixed feelings about a temple being rebuilt and sacrifices being made again. Because that flies in the face of Jesus Christ, right? The one sacrifice, the true Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But to, but to Israel, this is going to be miraculous. Right now, I don't know if you know this, but the Temple Mount has a, a shrine, a, a place of worship on there. It's a, it's a mosque, and it's, it flies in the face of Israel, right? And the, the people that, that worship there that... They don't want you to talk about the temple on the Temple Mount. They don't want to hear about the temple. They don't want to hear about God's people. And so this would be miraculous for a man to come and bring peace in the Middle East there and to allow a temple to be built. Miraculous enough for the, the Jewish people to go, this is the Messiah, and to be duped into believing this. Daniel says this is the abomination that's going to happen in the middle of it. Daniel, it's, it's confirmed in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. If you want to flip to that, you can. But in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, he really sets up the timeline. It says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, the abomination of desolation is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. 1,290 days is, is the exact count. Now, if you're a math magician like I am, you get your calculator out and you do the 1,000, whatever it is, divided by uh, 365, right? 365 days in the year, and you realize that it comes out to exactly 3.5. So you get this this timeline that Daniel shows us right in the middle, three and a half years, there's going to be this abomination of desolation happen, and you can count down the number of days until the end of the great tribulation, and that is the day that Jesus comes. That's the day he comes back. It's the day of the second coming. So in verse 14 out of our text, Jesus says, when this happens... Let those who are in Judea, which is the area surrounding Jerusalem, surrounding the temple, let them flee to the mountains. If you're on the housetop, he says, don't go in, don't pass go, do not collect $200, get out. I mean, it's, he's talking about quickly, in a hurry, don't do anything but run. And pray that it's not winter or that you're not pregnant or nursing. So he, he gives a very explicit direction to the people in Judea during this time if they see this happen, which is, is one of the things that I'm thinking of as I'm going through this and I'm studying through this, the reality sets in that there are going to be people there in that day that are reading this verse from the Bible going, whoa, that just happened. This is being fulfilled. And a part of the reason that Jesus spoke it is to let them know what to do. I mean, I love it. Absolutely. Verse 19, it says, For in those days there will be tribulation, 
such as has not been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor shall ever be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Man, Jesus, again, he's speaking to a specific people that are in Judea at this time who are in this time of the great tribulation, he's telling them to flee because it's going to get worse from there. It's kind of like once this this abomination happens, and and the world, as the abomination is that the Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies, he sits on the mercy seat and declares himself to be God. And once that happens, the Jewish people's eyes are going to be open. They're going to run. They're going to flee. But the world's going to go, okay, Maybe he is God. They're going to accept this. And at that point, it's like a pivotal point. God's going to bring in intense judgment that the world has never seen. I mean, worse than the days of Noah, worse than the flood. God is going to judge Christ rejecting a Christ-rejecting world. And it is going to be horrific. Horrific. So much so that unless God had shortened the days, and he did... Everyone would perish. I say he did because it says that he did in the scripture, but he's going to. This is future. This is a future event. But it is the, it is the turning point. And then Jesus, he continues on. He moves on to say, again, to reiterate at that time, verse 21, then at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. So again, it seems that Jesus is foretelling this in order that the people who are going to be there would be forewarned. They'd understand what's happening. Those that want to know, that are, that are looking to what he would say about their future, about the Antichrist, about his abomination, as to not to be deceived by him or by the false prophet or by his powers and his signs to deceive. And, and, and this, this period of time is going to be, again, Jesus just said, like no other time in history. And when I think about it and I, I think about it, the craziness of it, there's going to be malevolence and darkness like no other time in history. It's going to be wicked. There's going to be spiritual darkness, things that are happening that, again, they're deceptive, they're showing, they're signs and wonders. It says there to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus is, he, he, he's showing us a few things. Number one, he's showing us that the target of the enemy are the people of God. And this is just kind of like, uh, this is, <laughs> is kind of like a, a general kind of blanket statement for all of us. I want you to know this. If you're walking after the Lord, following Jesus, you are a target of the enemy, right? And it's, and it's I don't know, you, you might say a, a hearty amen. Like, as soon as I started following the Lord, all these horrible things happen, right? It could be one of those instances where you're realizing, oh, man, this is crazy. As soon as I made the decision, all these horrible things happen. And it happens. It happens in life. But it says there that he would deceive, again, the elect, to deceive you. You're, you're an enemy. But really quickly, when I think about this, uh, there's a couple of thoughts that come to my mind with the elect, the people that he, he can't deceive. And he's trying to deceive. And when I think about him going after the elect, I, I think, well, why would he go after people that are already deceived? That doesn't make sense. So he's going to, Jesus is revealing, he's going to go after believers. He's going to go after followers. And I think it's interesting that Jesus, he only tells us this statement he doesn't say that it's possible. He doesn't say he's going to uh, um, deceive the elect and it's possible. And he doesn't say it's not possible. He just kind of gives us this warning. If it's possible. 
The emphasis seems to me to be that we would be aware and ready that the enemy is going to attack the elect. And that we would stand on the truth of his word and we'd stand on who he is. It's, it's just interesting to me that he doesn't settle the debate here. He doesn't say, now, hey, but you're the elect, so don't even worry about it. He can't touch you. He warns us. He says he's going to come after even the elect, if possible, to deceive even the elect. He just seems to say, hey, you guys, you're the elect. Be ready. Stand on the word. Know that the enemy's coming. Now, I'm just pointing this out because Jesus brings it to our attention here. Personally, I don't believe any of us are going to be there. During this time, we're out of there. We're not going to be going through the great tribulation. Jesus is forewarning the people that are going through this time, this great tribulation. Verse 24, he says, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fail, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Now, there are people, you, you'll read commentaries and you'll look at this, and they want to give you all sorts of explanations as to what verse 24 and verse 25 mean right there, personally. They mean what they say. It's literal. This is going to be a crazy, insane time. It's going to be a dark time. There's going to be things happening that are not normal because it's the end of the age. But what does he say in verse 26? When you see all, this th all these things happen, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and with glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. He's going to come. He's going to gather the elect to himself. Jesus, after these things, after the sign, after the last half of the great tribulation, these horrible things that are going to come, after those days, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be dark. There's going to be no sun. I cannot imagine what it would be like with no light from the sun, with no stars of heaven, with no light reflecting off of the moon, the powers of heaven shaken. But then will be the second coming. Then Jesus will come. He will show up and make things right. Now, his second coming is described in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And I have to read it. If you want to turn there, go for it. Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11. This is what we're going to see. And we're going to see it. We're going to see it from behind him. Um, we're going to be an army that's coming with him, but we're really not going to do a whole lot of fighting because he's going to take care of everything. We're going to be more like, get him, Jesus, you know? Yes! We're going to be watching everything be made right, and our, oh, oh, it's going to be such a good day. Our hearts are going to be, so, I, I can't read this without just longing for it. Revelation 19.11 John says, now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a road a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's us. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I cannot wait for the day that Jesus makes everything right. 
And I think to myself, we have an opportunity, though. It's really a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to be alive while we are here now and to bow our life to this very King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And to be a part of one more person going with us. One more addition to the armies on those white horses to make ready the way for the king. So this is Jesus. This is his return. This is what it's going to look like. And now, now Jesus gives us a parable. This first, a couple of kind of parables. This first one is the parable of the fig tree. Starting in verse 28. And Jesus says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will by no means pass away. So Jesus, he gives us this parable. He tells us at the beginning to learn from it. He tells us to learn from it. it, it, it and so there's an emphasis on this parable. When I look at it, I, I think to myself, the most obvious and, and clear um, explanation of what this parable is, is probably the best interpretation for us to look at, which is, well, when you look at a fig tree, when its leaves begin to bud and grow, you know that summer is near. So the commentaries I went through said, hey, the fig trees are kind of a late bloomer when it comes to the season that they begin to bud. So it's toward the end of spring that they finally begin to get leaves, which makes it pretty clear summer is there when the leaves are on the fig tree. And just as you would see that happen in life, so too when you see these things happen, which things? Well, the sign that he was talking about, the tribulation, all of the things that he just spoke of, when you see these things happening, then his coming is at the door. He's, he's ready to return. Verse 30 says, this generation will by no means pass pass away until these things take place. So sort of the, the question arises, which generation? And I think the most literal interpretation, obvious interpretation, is the ones that see it begin to happen, right? The ones that are there, that see this thing playing out and see the abomination of desolation. You know they're going to go through the end of the tribulation. And of course, if they make it and are saved, believing in Jesus... They're going to be collected and gathered up. But there's another interpretation of this parable, of this passage that I think is, it's very viable. And I have to bring it to light. I have to just kind of share it with you guys here this morning. Um, and, and this other interpretation of this passage is that the fig tree is Israel. And I don't know if you guys have heard this before. You, you, you know, very well likely have. But the fig tree being Israel, and you guys know that at 70 AD, there was a huge battle. Israel was, well, the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. And, and from that time forward, Israel began to be displaced. Whoa, excuse me. Began to be displaced out of their homeland. And for, man, the greater part of 2,000 years, there was no nation of Israel in Israel. They were scattered. They were dispersed. They were dispersed all the way, and I think that Pastor Richard mentioned this last week. They were dispersed all the way until May 14th, 1948. And then something crazy began to happen and is still happening today. The nation of Israel has come back to its land and are continuing, Jewish people are continuing to return back to the land of Israel. This is prophesied throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament. They're coming back. Their branches becoming tender, the leaves beginning to bud. So in this interpretation of Israel coming back into the land and this being what we're seeing, 
the timeline of this interpretation depends on how long a generation is. If it's from May 14th, 1948, that Israel became a nation again, and that the, the people are returning back to Israel, and they still are. What is a generation? Well, a generation, it could be 40 years, but we know that it's already been past 40 years, right, since that time. Another common uh, idea of a generation from the Old Testament, I believe it's in Exodus when uh, God's talking about the generations of the children of Israel, um, is 100 years, which would be the longest amount of time that could be allotted for that generation. And if you do the math on that, it would put the second coming of Jesus somewhere around 2048. So it's still in our future. Now, again, this is just one that's interesting. Is it, is it absolutely going to happen that way? I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. We will find out. Time will tell. Hopefully we won't find out. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I just kind of feel like between you and me here that um, Jesus is coming soon. I'll just say it like that. But if a generation was 70 years since May 18th, 1948, that would be 2018. So if it was 80 years, that would be 2028. And if it was 100 years, it would be 2048. All that to say, if you look at the prophecy in this parable like that, we're getting close. We're getting into a, a point of time that's a little exciting for us. Either way, Jesus ends this section of scripture with a very solid word, and it was this, that his word will come to pass. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will by no means pass away. And then wrapping up this morning, this, this last little sort of parable and, and explanation, Jesus in verse 32 says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and each, or sorry, to each of his servants work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Hmm. This last little section here is interesting. And I think it's kind of peculiar, even more so because it seems to sort of contradict the first part of all of this chapter 13, in this, the idea is Jesus is showing us a specific time and then giving us a number of days until he comes in his second coming. All these things to watch for and that we would know when the second coming happens if we're in that tribulation period. Now, all of a sudden, he goes, but you're not going to know when I come. It sort of, sort of sounds like it's, it's a different coming. And, and when you look and compare the scriptures where Jesus talks about, there's two things. One of them is him in great power, in great glory. It's chaos in the world, horrible things happening. And another one is sort of business as usual, and you're not going to know, and it's going to come. So we have these two ideas of two comings of Jesus and it seems to be sort of a, a change because we don't know. His emphasis in this section is you don't know the time that he's coming. So be ready. Be waiting. Be watching. In fact, there in the beginning of that section, he, he says there in verse 33, take heed, watch, and one more thing, and pray. And pray. So we have this, this interesting, different content. I, I would say this is speaking namely of his coming to take away the bride, the rapture of the church. 
And he gives us some practical advice, instruction as to what we are to be doing as we're watching and waiting. So as we look through the scripture, there's a few things. First one is we, we, we don't know when it's going to happen. And he says nobody does, right? Nobody knows when it's going to happen. So right off the bat, here we have something that we shouldn't be doing, and that's guessing when he's coming, right? There's no need to guess when he's coming. We're just supposed to be ready. That's, an, that's the important thing for us. So if you're, if you're starting to align yourself with a group of people that's guessing when he's coming, I'll tell you one day he's not going to come on the day that everyone thinks he's coming because it says there no one's going to know. Uh, the second thing I see here is it says that even the son doesn't know, which isn't to take away from the deity of Jesus at all. All that reveals to us is that this is not a part of the, the father's plan is for Jesus to reveal the time of this coming. It's just not something he is doing when he's here on earth as part of his ministry. But it's something that he wouldn't know or reveal in the flesh. Third thing, we see verse 34 Jesus is the man going to the far country, which is him after his death and resurrection uh, and ascension going to heaven. We are the ones in this story who are left in his house, and he's given us a few things. The first thing he's given us is authority. He's given us authority. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And I, I, I want to say something this morning. There is no more authority that we have than his word to stand on to live according to this should be our final authority in our life and i'm i'm talking big prophetic scope i'm talking in the things that we do in the daily decisions that we make may we take them to the final authority and that be the word of god in our lives not dr phil or whoever else his word is our authority so he's given us authority. Number two, he's given us each a work. We each have a work. We got something to do that God has given us to do while we're here. And it's for such a time as this. I mean, if you're, if you're here this morning, you think, God, I don't know what the work is. Ask him. Because he has something for us. He told us that he does. And third, he has commanded. Well, it says there that there, he commanded a watchman to watch. But if you look right after he commands the watchman to watch, he commands that we are all to watch. So third, we are to watch. And he gives us all that same command in verse 35 there. So we don't know when Jesus is coming, but we do know that we're supposed to be ready, we're supposed to be watching, we're supposed to be praying, and we're supposed to be about the work that he has for us to do. And at the end of verse 35, he tells us that it could be really, he says, the way he says it is interesting. It could be at a handful of different times. And really, it's morning, noon, night, middle of the night sort of thing, right? It could be any time of the day, which is kind of like to say, have you ever heard the, the saying, it's five o'clock somewhere? It will be two o'clock somewhere when Jesus comes. I guarantee it. And that's, that's what we see here. He is going to come on a day. But here's the thing that's exciting. It's going to be on a day called today. And Jesus is telling us we are not to be unaware. We're not to be spiritually sleeping. We're not to be caught off guard. We're to be prepared. We're to be watching. We're to be ready. We're to be praying. We're to be about his work. We're to be looking at the seasons and the world around us and allowing those things to cause us to be excited because Jesus is coming. And I think we should be, of all people alive on the face of the earth today, we should be excited. I mean, even to the point where people are like, are you kidding me? Can't you see what's going on in the world? Oh, yeah, it's exciting. What? You've got to be kidding me. No, it's so exciting. We're, we're to be watching, ready, praying. 
listen, that kind of excludes. We're not to be, he didn't say, so you know what you should do? Dig a big hole and put food in there. He didn't say that. He didn't say, get a basement. He didn't say, get as many guns as you can. Please, weapons, swords, get all the, he didn't say that. We're to be about his work. We're to be watching. We're to be praying. Of course, I, I think we, God did give us a brain. We should use common sense. We should prepare somewhat, but we trust in God. We trust in God. We trust in him. We're to be busy about the work of our Father. And personally, it's so easy for us to get wrapped up and distracted with all those other things. All those other things. We're to be busy about the Father's work, the work of his kingdom. What Jesus got caught doing when he was a kid. Remember when he got lost when he was a kid? What was he doing? He told his parents, didn't you know I'd have to be about my Father's business Man, him as a 13-year-old makes me look sad today, like as an adult, right? <laughs> that we would be about his business because it's more important than any of the work that we'd be involved in in this world. It's more important than any of the building of our own life and our own kingdom. I guarantee you what's not going to matter when Jesus comes back is what kind of car you're driving. That is not going to matter when Jesus comes back. You're going to say, well, you've seen my Mercedes, haven't you? Who cares? What's going to matter is that we're walking with the Lord. Is that we're found worthy, this life, the things in this life. And so the question comes this morning as we wrap up, as we close, and I want to ask Beth to come up if she's out there. The question that I have is, for me, for myself, is... Am I living that life prepared? And am I living with the attitude of, I want to be well-pleasing to you with my life. So that when I see you, God, there be no shame. There be no question marks. I'll just run to you. Man, what, 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 what thought comes into your mind if you thought of him appearing in the clouds right now, is it run to him or like, oh, scared? Think about it. Think about it. Is it, man, I shouldn't have looked at that last night? Man, I shouldn't have drank that last night? Or is it, oh, Jesus, I'm going to you. And may we live that life expecting and wanting and looking, not afraid, Excited that he could come soon. Excited that today could be the day. And if you're not ready this morning, it's time to make sure that you are. It's time to be ready. And I just want to invite you to know this morning that the altar, and it's not this pulpit, it's not this area up here, but I just want to let you know that the altar of God is open for business. And there is no time better than now to do business with God through the precious blood of Jesus and to be made ready for his coming. Let's all stand together.
God, that's our desire this morning. Lord, to give you our life, to give you our heart, to hold nothing back, to be fully assured that we can know, we can know that we know that we have a ticket to heaven. And it's not my righteousness, it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us, that makes us right, that gives us that ticket to ride. And God, we are so thankful. We're so grateful, God. We're so grateful to be able to to take the hope that we have this morning and look at your word and say, God is going to make all things right. And he's coming. Praise you, Lord. But God, if there's if there's one this morning that needs to be ready, that needs to be prepared, I just challenge you to do it. Don't leave this place without saying, God, I am a sinner and I need saving. I cannot cleanse myself. I need the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for that washing. And we thank you for the picture of that that we get to celebrate this afternoon at 2 o'clock, the baptism. You've brought this old man back to life from the dead. Died in Christ and risen in the power of the Spirit of God. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.